All right, picking up from last week where we stopped, um, we hit the slides for uh, relationships, and that's where we're going to pick up today. So, actually, I did talk about relationships, didn't I? Oh, no, actually, I did a little bit, but not very much. Okay. There's some, a few redundant slides. Okay, so one-to-one, -one, we already talked about that, and we know many and many-to-many. One-to-one -many. Uh, -one is, you know, there's only one thing to have one thing, like a student to a locker. One-to-many is like a prof to students or a student to classes. Uh, many-to-many, for those of you that remember it, I called it the Kentucky relationship, where everything is related to everything else. Uh, physically impossible in a database, unlike in Kentucky. Okay, at some point, somebody decided they really needed to give the different degrees of relationships names. Instead of just saying first, second, third degree, they decided to call it unary, binary, and ternary. 90% of relationships in a database are binary. Rarely do you see unary or ternary. All right, a unary relationship is when a relationship is related, like an, an entity is related to itself. It's not a common thing to see, but you'll sometimes see it in a tree-like structure. For example, in an HR system, you'll have employees and the managers, then the manager's managers, and then the boss is above them. And that will be, but they're all employees. So it's a self-referencing table where you'll have a relationship where one of the attributes is basically the primary key of another record in the same table. Um, those of us of a certain vintage probably remember a website called Yahoo. Um, everybody in here under a certain vintage probably goes, what? Uh, Yahoo used to be a directory. Before we had Google, before we had search engines, the best way to find things on the internet was a directory service. Yahoo was the best known directory service at the time. And it used a tree-like structure. Link name, link, potentially parent. And then you'd have categories that basically built up with URLs inside of them. A binary relationship is when there's two different uh, types related to each other. Um, student locker, that's a binary relationship. It's a one-to-one, -one, but it's a binary relationship. A uh, ternary relationship is when you got three different entities related to each other. Um, I always struggle to come up with a good example for a ternary relationship because you almost never see them. Um, you'll have entities that have lots of relationships tied to them. It looks like a big giant star. But the thing is that each of the entities in there are only participating in a binary relationship with each table. Rarely will you have three tables that are also related to each other. So it would be. Um, Like even I'm trying to think, I know something that's realistic like that, but essentially you have entity A related to entity B related to entity C related to entity A. So you got it's a circular relationship. Um, it's not something you see very often because if you said A to B, A to C, those are binary, but A to B, B to C, C to A is a ternary because they're all related to each other um, directly. So here's the example of the employee that I just used. Uh, employee department's another good example. Um, most employees only ever work in one department. And, you know, there's two entities involved in that relationship. So it's a um, binary relationship. They use a ternary relationship to explain the professor-student course, which is patently false. But I guess they were struggling to try to come up with an example of what that would be. Because realistically, it's professor, student, course, with a course section in the middle. So there's actually a fourth table involved. It's not a ternary. There's actually, you know, three binary relationships. Um, and it's like that pretty much at every level of education. You guys all have course sections. Luckily for you, you have one course section for this, you know, unlike the 8215 students this semester that have five sections. All right, cardinality constraints. So cardinality constraints is the number of instances 
that one entity can or must be associated with an instance of another entity. And it's kind of funny because we use the terms minimum and maximum constraints. Well, realistically, each of those only has two options. So it's not like you're going to say, hey, minimum of four. No, minimum of zero or one. Zero means the relationship is optional. One means it's mandatory. For example, student locker, going back to the student locker example, the relationship is optional on both sides. Therefore, the minimum cardinality between student locker would be zero. Um, a relationship between a student and a student card here at the college or you pass or whichever you happen to have as applicable. The relationship at that point is more or less mandatory because you get one whether you want it or not, but it's, one to, it's still one to one, but at that point it's mandatory on both sides. Maximum cardinality is the other way around. It's the maximum number participating. And you have two choices, one or many. It's not one, two, four, eight. It's either it's only one or it's lots. Going back to the example of the student and locker, it's a relationship. A locker can be associated at, with one student at most. Therefore, maximum cardinality of one, minimum cardinality of zero. So a locker is optional, but a student can only ever have one locker. The maximum cardinality, on the other hand, uh, will go with um, student sections, for example. Or actually, I'll just go prof student. We'll just skip all the other crap in the middle. I can have one or more students. If I have zero students, I don't have a class. Therefore, the minimum, the max, the it's mandatory. There must be one, or the maximum participation is many. In other words, I have one or more students. When the maximum cardinality um, is many and the minimum cardinality is zero. It's also often read as uh, zero or more, zero, one or more, depending on what school you went to. There's two ways to take that wording. So you have zero or more or zero, one or more, um, which means it's optional, but you can't have many things in your order. Um, a good example of that one would be uh, going to Loblaws, we're gonna buy some bananas, not everybody will buy bananas, but people are allowed to buy more than one pound of bananas at a time. Therefore, minimum cardinality is zero, maximum cardinality is whatever much you want to buy. So that's the how that works. So when we're talking about relationships, we have certain symbols, and we're actually going to be going into these symbols in more detail in a few minutes. Um, which is why it's always awkward when I overlap week one into week two, because week two has a bit of review in it from week one, which is specifically these symbols. Um, you'll have, in Crow's footnotation, there are four symbols you use. And they are, the one at the top left is a mandatory one. So that is one and only one. Optional one means zero or one. So here we're back to our lockers. This is lockers. This is a U pass. The bottom one is a mandatory many. In other words, there must be multiple items for it to be valid, and there must be at least one. And optional many. This is an example with the bananas. So you have the option of having many bananas or no bananas. The mandatory many is often used in when you're talking about placing orders. Can you have a valid order that you pay for if there's nothing in the order? It's a bit of a philosophical question, but philosophical question, but it's not really. When you go to check out on Amazon, would Amazon let you check out an empty shopping cart? No. Therefore, it requires at least one item. Will Amazon stop you from buying a hundred different things? Absolutely not. Jeff needs a new boat. Therefore, he's going to let you buy as much as you want, whether you can afford it or not. 
So that's why it's min minimum one, mandatory, maximum many. And that's how you read those symbols. So the example at the bottom here, we have a patient to have patient history. A patient can have, must have at least one history. They can have many histories. As anybody who's ever spent a little bit of time in the hospital, they will attest how much paperwork is involved in a simple visit. It's all electronic now, but I remember what, before it became all electronic. And by the time you're, you know, released, and when the wait times were, weren't 18 hours, you know, it's about five, you'd have a sack of paper that thick by the time they were done with you. There'd be many medical records. You had to have at least one. The second you checked in at the front counter, or at triage, there was a record tied to you. At that point, you were a valid patient. You must have a medical record. Each entry in the patient history belongs to one and only one patient. Like when they do your blood work, those results don't belong to the person next to you. Well, hopefully it doesn't. But it doesn't belong to the person next to you. It belongs to you and only you. It's tied to your patient record. Um, so a one of many relationship, they've got flights and flights attendants. It's showing that AC123 has a flight attendant at Joe. LH456 has Sue and Bob. Uh, BA231 has Alice and Tom. If we were to discuss this, the cardinality is a minimum of one because any passenger aircraft with more than so many passengers, if I remember right, it's eight, must have a flight attendant legally. Um, so each flight has a minimum of one. There's no real maximum how many flight attendants they can have. Therefore, it's one to many. And it's maximum mandatory one, maximum many. And if we were to draw it with the symbols, it would look like this. So an attendant can only be on one flight and only one flight at a time. And each flight must have at least one, but can have multiple attendants. That one's actually a fairly easy one to understand. Can attendant be on two planes at the same time? If they can, they're extra special. But realistically, each flight must have at least one attendant. They may have more than one. Um, if we were talking about a right now, basically profs, we have classes. Uh, some profs don't have classes. Some classes don't have profs. It would be drawn like this. A prof has optional many classes and a class that has an optional one prof. You can't have two profs for one class. Imagine if there's two of us up here competing for attention. Wouldn't work. Realistically, between semesters, I am a prof that doesn't have classes. So I'll have like three weeks where I have no classes. Therefore, at that point, classes are optional as far as I am concerned. And there's times where when they start course loading. So, for example, I'll probably get my, uh, my first offers for the summer term. Start of March. Start of March, what they're doing is they're looking at their enrollment for the summer. They figure out how many classes they need. There will be classes and courses created that don't have profs yet. Then they assign the profs and then fill in with part-timers after that. So the classes also have an optional relationship to the professor. Just so you know how a little bit of that works on the inside. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this is a small aside about naming conventions. Um, you'll notice that for the week two lecture, I'm going to skip through a lot of stuff really fast because I basically covered like a quarter of the lecture right now. Um, so naming conventions, way back in the day, they used to be loose and free. Uh, by that, I mean, people used to do whatever they wanted. Um, originally, because of space constraints, naming used to be pretty cryptic. Um, you have to think in account, like you guys are thinking, oh, my laptop's hard drive is small. It's 256 gigs. Bruh. At my first co-op, their mini computer, not a mainframe, not a PC, a mini. It was the size of this desk and this desk put together. That was a whole computer. 
because it was old. Yeah. Yeah. You have to speak up a bit. And zero or more classes. Uh, well, there could be a class with no professor assigned to it yet. So it's zero or one professor. Well, well, no, but sometimes we create the courses and we don't, we don't have the teachers for them yet because they're not assigned to it. For example, I'm going to get my course assignments in March. Middle of February, they're going to create all the new course sections for the summer term. Then they're going to look at what profs they have available and start assigning them to the courses. The courses exist without the profs at that point. Like the second they create the course, the prof does not get assigned. The course exists, and then they give it to a prof. Right? For example, they create a video game nobody's playing yet, but the video game exists. And then somebody signs up and starts playing the game. No, I'm not assigned to anything yet. No, of course you can. But the professor has to be there on day one. Up till then, there could be no prof. It's happened. Where we had entire course sections with no professors till like the day before. How do I know? I got one of those. Literally, I got hired two days before the course started. And they said, this is your course Saturday morning at 8 a.m. That was Thursday. Another example? Uh, hey, let's go to Amazon again. You have products in Amazon that have never been ordered. This product can be ordered many times, but it may never have been ordered. An order may not have any products in it yet, but the order exists. You added an order, you added stuff, you took it back out. Suddenly the order still exists, but there's nothing there. So the order is empty. It's possible for entities to exist. In other words, both of these are strong entities. Remember I talked about strong entities last week? We can go back to the locker, which is one-to-one, -one, but it's the same idea. A locker exists without a student. A student exists without a locker. So they're optional on both sides. It's the same idea. Except... In the case of this, a prof can teach many classes. Each class is taught by one prof. In theory, I could be assigned to 8215 and 8250 because I'm assigned to two. Or 8250 just got created, but they haven't assigned a prof to it yet. But the course exists. Students are assigned to it, but we don't know who's teaching it yet. Therefore, there's no professor attached to it. Okay? No problem. Okay. So back to my example. First, my co-op when I was in college. Computer was the size of this desk. It had the hard drive. The hard drive alone was the size of this desk, like physically this big. It was ten megabytes. That's two pictures on my Galaxy S22. Just so you know, that's how much room it it took. It was a really old computer. I mean, it was old by the top, by my standards then. Okay, I'm not aging myself that, but companies still had old hardware. It, it ran. It ran great. It never died. Those machines never died. But when you're designing a database, the metadata takes up room. So the fact that a field is called first space or first underscore name, that occupies bytes. On our gigabyte size drives, terabyte size drives, who cares about eight bytes? When you're talking about 10 megabytes to run an entire multi-million dollar company, those take up a lot of room, so therefore people were cryptic. You'd have a table called A with fields A1, A2, A3. And then you had something called a data dictionary. It was terrible. Um, each company had its own standard. Often each developer at the, inside of a company had their own standard. When I first started working in Ottawa, I inherited an old a system that was written by three different people. Everything, every table that was created by a different person looked different. It was complete garbage. Um, that you can imagine how much grief that would cause because 
There's no standards. You don't know what things are called. You know, who knows? Um, thanks to modern development frameworks, a de facto standard is starting to emerge. Um, for those of you that don't know what a de facto standard is, a de facto standard is basically a standard that is emerging that no official standard group has approved. We, uh, most of you have probably seen like ISO 9001 on the side of a building somewhere, or on the side of a truck or something. That's, you know, industry standards organization. Uh, ANSI is another one that's commonly seen. Uh, ANSI is actually the ones in charge of like the USB standard. And I think they're also the ones that do Wi-Fi. There's just different organizations that have standards. So a de facto standard is when a bunch of different companies say, you know what, this is pretty good. We like it. We're just going to keep using this, but we're never going to ratify it as a standard. Um, what brought about the change to the naming conventions and databases and standard is a product and that for a lot of you guys is actually really old. For me, it's just like a flash in the pan and disappeared. Uh, Ruby on Rails. There's a language called Ruby. It had this thing called a framework called Rails. Ruby as a language is terrible. The concept of Rails was the coolest thing ever. You designed your database the right way following its rules. Magic happened. You didn't need to write SQL. It did it for you. You didn't need to do X, Y, Z because it took care of it for you. It had something on ORM, an object relational mapper, which would map you know code objects to database objects and take care of data types and all that fun stuff for you. It was great. Yeah. Was that SQL what? Yeah, there's yeah, Alchemy is one, uh, because Alchemy is instead of Flask. Um uh, uh Symphony is a big one in PHP. Um, which when Rails came out, everybody thought it was the cat's meow, people jumped on the bad bad bandwagon. Uh for example, one of the big quote unquote success stories is Shopify. It's all written in Ruby. Um yeah. It is what it is. Um, and then the other development languages look at it and go, hey, that's really cool. We can do that too. Then we get Flask for Python, uh, Cake PHP, Laravel, Code Igniter for PHP. There's PHP is like a 25 of them now. Um, but the thing is that they all pretty much decided to follow the same naming conventions. If you follow certain naming conventions, the code just works. There's just some small variances between the different things. And the, this is basically the naming conventions that have evolved out of this. Everything is lowercase. No exceptions. No camel case. Why no camel case? Because different database servers treat case sensitivity differently. MySQL is stupid. It doesn't care. Which is cool. But it's bad. Microsoft SQL Server cares depending what language it's installed in. You install it in English, it's fine. It's case insensitive. You install it in Cyrillic, for some known reason it's case sensitive for a language that is not case sensitive. I don't know how that works. But they decided to make case sensitive. Oracle lies. Because Oracle stores whichever way you put it in, and then it stores it in uppercase in metadata so it can always find it. So it just lies. And then you got another database engine that's really popular, Postgres. PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL is anal retentive. Uh, it is the world's most case sensitive database you will ever see, which is fantastic because you have to tell it to be insensitive instead of you know trying to force it to be something it's not. Um, no spaces. Always use underscores. That's a rule of thumb for all database. And do not use spaces because you're just going to make your developers' lives hell. Tables are plural whenever possible. This is the one where there's some um, disagreement between different frameworks. So make your tables plural. Customers, orders. Why? Because it's a table that holds a bunch of customers. Um, ex exceptions, this would be names that imply plurality, such as log. Not a log like a piece of wood. Customer log. It implies plurality by default. It's not customer logs. It's a log that contains records. <laughs> it's just a fun one. Uh, primary keys are called ID, just ID. Um, why? Because you never need to know what the primary key is called. 
it's always ID. Um, foreign keys are named using the rule of singular parent table name plus underscore plus primary key name. For example, we have a, user, a table called users. The primary key ID would have a foreign key name of user ID. Why is it user ID? Because it's the ID of a single user. Where do we find said user? Where you find all the other users in the user table. It's magic. Um, it gets a little weird with certain ones. Um, one of my popular examples that gets weird is uh, person, persons, people. It depends on the implication of how you want to use the word person and the word people, right? Technically, people could be a plural of persons, but it also implies nationalities. You got person and persons, which also implies multiple person, but usually it's not used to indicate a group of people. You know, there are weird cases. And at that point, you just have to make a judgment call and say, this is what we're going to call it and roll with it. Um, you know, it is what it is. Okay. Now to jump into this week. No, not that icon. The other right icon. Okay. The huh. database model. Now, a database can be modeled as a collection of entities and the relationships amongst the entities. Um, normally, when we're talking about modeling a database, we're talking about using an ER diagram. Um, also known as an entity relationship diagram. And it, this is one of those fun ones where you'll hear a person say, hey, I want the ERD diagram. No, nah, you don't need to say diagram because that's what the D is. But people will still say it because that's just how people are. Um, the ER diagram is the blueprint from which the data is actually uh, is stored. It's the output of the design phase. Uh, you can think of the ER diagram as the, uh, trying to come up with a proper word. Well, it's some bits, it is a blueprint. It's almost how you think about how you're going to build a house. And there's different flavors of them. So an ERD allows us to sketch a database diagram, the design itself. It's a graphical tool um, that's widely used in database design. That's not a mystery. Um, Trying to do any kind of database work without an ER diagram is not a good time. Um, an ER diagram can also be the logical structure of a database. So there's this, the different flavors of them. Um, but in the end, what an ERD does, it's a diagram that identifies the concepts or entities that exist in a system and how they're interconnected with each other. And I will actually have examples in a few minutes. So an ERD serves several purposes. Um, a database analyst or a designer will get better understanding of information contained in the database through the process of constructing the ERD. You cannot create a proper diagram if you don't understand the data being going into the database. So you need to understand the structure of the data to create your diagram. It's a documentation tool. Um, very important documentation tool. When, if you're the only person that's ever worked on a database, so you start a project, you're the only person that worked on it, and you decide, hey, that's cool. I don't need to diagram this. It's only me. And then suddenly somebody else gets hired. And Suddenly, you have to create an ERD diagram, which you should have been doing from the beginning, because they will have no idea how things are interconnected and what the relationships are. And in the end, the ERD is also used to communicate logical structure of the database to the users. And again, there's different kinds of ER diagrams with different levels of complexity, so you can use the appropriate kind of diagram for the target audience. You would not bring a physical ERD diagram, so a diagram that actually does the physical mapping of the database, 
to a meeting with a client that can barely tie their shoes. Also known as a manager. You will bring them a simplified diagram known as a conceptual diagram where the major entities are on it. It shows the relationships. With a few moments, you can explain what the symbols mean and what the lines mean. And most of the time, they can work their way through what it is. We'll be talking about both types. So when we're talking about conceptual diagrams, we have three symbols plus the lines. Entities are square. Relationships are diamonds. Attributes are ovals. An entity is a thing. The attribute describes a thing. The relationship and the cardinality explains how one thing is related to another thing. So, optional relationships, just a quick reminder. An employee may or may not be assigned to a department. A patient may or may not be assigned to a room. Um, that second one is getting more and more real every day, especially in Ontario, where you might be a patient at the hospital, but you're spending your entire st stay in a hallway. Um, every course must be taught by at least one teacher, which is back to his issue he had, where a course might not have a teacher, but it can't must have a teacher to be taught. If that makes sense. And this one here always causes controversy. Every mother has at least one child. Uh, I hate bringing that one up, but the, whoever wrote these slides thought it was a great example. But it's technically the truth. If you've had a kid, you're a mother. If you didn't have a kid, you're not a mother. Unless you adopted the kid, therefore the controversy. Uh, but essentially at that point, even if you adopted the still your child, therefore every mother has at least one child. We could turn around and say every father has at least one child. Make sure everybody's included where every parent has at least one child to make sure absolutely everybody's included in that statement. Really need to update that slide because it gets awkward every semester. Okay, cardinality constraints. Um, we already talked about that. We talked about this. Well, here's our symbols. So here's, here's what I'm gonna start skipping through slides that I already did 20 minutes ago. Um, we got the mandatory one, the mandatory many, Optional one, optional many. You will notice in this case, we have a diamond involved. As before, we just had two boxes. Um, it's just different styles of the same thing. Um, so in a model, we wish to indicate that each school may enroll many students or may not enroll any students at all. Uh, we also wish to indicate that each student attends only one school. Uh, if we didn't include the diamond in the middle, it would look like this. Um, so a school has zero or more students. A student can have one or more schools. And he's about to say, well, how can you have a school without any students? J.H. Putman over on Bel Air Drive has no students. It was a school. It's still a school, but there's no more students there. No, it's not even all available to the students to register anymore. But it is technically still a school that's used for training. Yeah. No, the school... Yeah, yeah, well, the school is, has the option to have students. They chose to not exercise it. The student attends one school and only one school. Eh? They're, they're not accepting students at that school at all. Zero, zero students. They have no teachers there anymore. But it's still a school. Ottawa, Ottawa Public School Board still owns it, still operates it as a school. It's used to train teachers. But they're not students. They're employees. No, no they're employees. It's not the same thing. It's, it's words. Words are complicated. So a student attends one and only one school. Anybody in here ever attend more than one high school at once? Were you ever registered at more than one high school at the same time? Technically? So so you were able to go to school A on Monday, school B on Tuesday? Well, therefore, you were only enrolled in one school. Realistically, you were only enrolled in one school. But I know what you're saying. 
Yep. Yeah. So technically, students can be only enrolled in one school. Okay, so when we create an ERD, we have a few steps. We identify the entities, we identify the attributes, we try to identify the primary keys if possible, we then do the relationships, do the cardinality constraints, we draw the ERD, we check the ERD. All right, so there's gonna be a bunch of different slides, one after another. I recommend that those of you that have laptops that are turned on, I can't split my screen on two separate things. I'd love to be able to keep two different displays going at the same time, but I can't. So we got a big long paragraph of text. And we're going to take this paragraph and turn it into a diagram. A company has several departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. Employees must be assigned to one, but possibly more departments. At least one employee is assigned to a project, but an employee may be on vacation, not assigned to any projects. The important data fields are the name of the department, project supervisors and employees, as well as a supervisor and employee number and a unique project number. So we got a big block of text. So the first thing we want to do is start identifying identities. So what you want to do is you want to look for the nouns. And based on the nouns, you'll only select them once. So after we go through this whole paragraph, Realistically, there's only five unique nouns. Even though we'll reuse them multiple times, there's only five unique things. A company has several departments. So we have company, departments, supervisor, employee, and project. That's the first time we saw each of those words. A true entity should have, only, should have more than one instance. In this case, we're talking about a company. Therefore, the company is not a valid entity in this case, because it'll only ever exist once in the system. We're modeling the processes and the data at the company. We're not modeling the company itself. So, yes. So, uh, several companies belonging to an umbrella company, then you'd model the companies. But since we're talking about a company, we don't need to worry about it because we're only talking about the one. So if it has only one instance ever existing in your database system, you don't need to model it. So the next step after we identify the relationships is to identify the associations. Now, you'll notice how that last, that little block at the bottom is so freaking ugly compared to the rest of the slides. That was scanned from my textbook when I went through school. That's how old this example is. Okay, everything else got retyped. But this is a really old example, just shows. And what's really cool is one of the other courses here was using the exact same textbook I was using, just a newer edition. It was the most boring book on earth. But it wasn't broken, it was very good, it was just the most dry thing ever. So what we had was something called a relationship matrix. So a lot of you guys have seen stuff like this where you know you go what's the connection from this to this and you're basically putting x's on how things are interconnected and in this case what we'll end up doing is instead of putting in x's we'll put in verbs based on what we saw in the paragraph so we'll build a matrix so we got department employee supervisor and project and then we'll go department employee and employee is assigned a department the department is assigned employees a department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to a department. An employee works on a project. An employee has no relationship to other employees. And a lot of people are going to say, well, employees are connected to the supervisors. If you reread it, not once do you see employee and supervisor connected in those statements. Supervisor runs a department, and that is it. A project uses an employee but is not connected to a supervisor, is not connected to a department, it's not connected to obviously to another project. And for anybody who feels like arguing about it, you can go reread the paragraph and you'll see that this is right. So then, uh, so you go through each cell to decide whether or not there's an association. Obviously a department has no connection to department. So therefore we leave those empty. 
So we end up with a chart that looks like this. So then we take these and we convert them into sentences. A department is assigned an employee. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to a department. An employee works on a project. A supervisor runs a department. A project uses an employee because it's a resource for the project. Cool. So now we've identified our entities. We've identified the relationships between them. So then we're going to draw a rough ERD. Entities go in rectangles. Diamonds and lines represent the relationships with the entities. So a few quick examples would be this. But the proper way to diagram it would be like this. So an employee works on a project. The department is run by a supervisor. You'll notice that there's no cardinalities yet. There's just entities and the relationships. Cardinalities come in a bit. You also have a department is assigned an employee. Cool. So if we were to put them all together, the diagram looks like this. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee works on a project. And department is assigned an employee. And employee is assigned a department. So currently, we've established our entities. We've created the relationships between them. So then we're going to figure out the cardinality. Now, if we go back to the big, long paragraph, you'd see that each department has one supervisor. Each supervisor has one department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments. An employee, so each department must have one or more employees. Each project has one or more employees. And if when it comes to the project side, each employee can have zero or more projects. So if we take these statements and we convert it um, after we go these different kinds of relationships, which is this yet another review and another review. <laughs> this is what it looks like once you put in the cardinalities. So a department must be run by a supervisor and only one supervisor. A supervisor runs one and only one department. Yes, I know a supervisor could be an employee. It's actually covered on this diagram. It is. So I'm going to take care of the first one. So yes, right now, we, I realize that supervisors are usually employees, but the way this was formulated in the description, they make it sound like employees and supervisors are two different kinds of creatures or entities in this case. Um, is it really like that in the real world? No, but that's how the paragraph made it described. So that's what we work with. Um, right, I'm going to go to the department and employees. An employee belongs to one or more departments. A department has one or more employees. As far as they're concerned, that description says a department cannot exist without an employee. And an employee cannot exist unless it's a, they're assigned to a department. So it's one to many on both sides. And then we have an employee works on zero or more projects. If they're on vacation, therefore they're working on zero projects. They could be working on one project. They could be working on many projects. So zero or more, zero, one or more. Each project must have at least one employee, otherwise it's a dead project, so it must have at least one employee. There could be more than one person working on a given project. So at this point, we've taken that paragraph, we've turned it into a, well, this is considered a, um, a traditional conceptual diagram, a traditional ERD. The technical term for this is a Chen diagram, Chen style diagram, C-H-E-N. Uh, there was a data, data scientist, uh, if I remember, his name was Peter Chen. And he's the one that came up with this particular kind of diagram in the 70s. It's been around for a while. I think this diagram and I were born almost at the same time. So, you know, there is a, what they call an extended ERD where we suddenly start adding other things to it. Um, this is just more examples of the same thing. So now we are, what we're going to do is we're going to add the primary key. So we're starting to fall into the world of extended ERDs, where we're going to fill it all out. The simplified one, this one here, is perfect to take to your manager, perfect to take to a business client that is not technical. Because you could take this and explain to them pretty quickly 
you know, these are the things I identified. This is how they're, uh, this is how I understand how they're connected. It's a, it's a basic symbology that almost anybody can understand with very minimal training. This one starts getting a little busier. So a supervisor has a supervisor number, because we remember he did discuss that. The department name, that's the only thing we know is the department name, so that's probably its primary key. We know an employee has an employee number, and the project has a project number. Those are the primary keys, so we're going to put them into the diagram. You will notice that they're underlined. Attributes that are identifiers are underlined. And then we want to identify the attributes, and then we get the wall of text. Um, so essentially, when we're identifying the attributes, we want to identify all the attributes essential to the system we're trying to study without necessarily matching them up. Because it's entirely possible that you'll look at paperwork and you'll have just all kinds of pieces of information. You just write them all out on a piece of paper. Uh, you'll study the forms, the files, the reports currently kept by the users. And if you have a paper copy, you'd actually draw on them. Um, Cross out those that won't be transferred to the new system because often older systems had documents that had lots of extra fields in case somebody needed them. You may not want to bring them across, so anything you identify that will not be brought across, you can just cross out and just don't take it with you. Um, the remaining circled items should represent the attributes you need. Uh, always validate your data with your end users. So at that point, it's part of the discovery process. You're talking to the people in shipping, the people in order entry, the salespeople, insert other staff here. Because there could be a person in shipping says, we never use this field because they've never seen it filled in because it doesn't get filled in until it's been shipped and it's somebody in accounting that fills it in, right? So you got to make sure that you're not going to eliminate real data. Um, so if you go back to our big wall of text that we had earlier, the only attributes indicated are the names of the department, projects, supervisors, and employees. We know that the supervisor and the employee number and the unit project number. So we know that we have the names and the numbers. So then we're going to map the attributes. Each attribute should only belong to one entity. If an entity should belong to more than one, sorry, if, more, if an attribute should belong to more than one entity, for example, a name, uh, in this case, you might need to add a modifier to the attribute name to make it unique. Customer name, employee name, et cetera, just so that you know what name you're talking about. Um, or you determine which entity attribute would best be described. Um, if you have anything left over without a corresponding entity, you may have missed something. As in, while you were doing your design phase, you missed an entity outright. And it happens. That's something you're going... Well, I got this one thing called BOM, and I don't know what the what BOM stands for, but it's here. Nobody says we use it, but I don't I can't figure out where it belongs. It could well be it's because you're connected, you're missing an entity that it needs. Um, so you want to identify these missing entities and add them to the relationship matrix, and then go through that process again. So then, if we look at the attributes, we got department name. We know it belongs to department. Employee number. Employee name belongs to employee. Supervisor number and name belongs to the supervisor. Project name and number will belong to the project. Okay, now the diagram got really complicated really fast because whoever made these slides deleted a slide. And I keep meaning to bring it back and I talk about it every semester. Then I promptly forget about it by the time I get home. ADD for the win. So, What's happened here is it resolved the many-to-many -many relationships. If you remember here, we have a many-to-many -many relationship here and here. Just for you guys who don't feel left out. Many-to-many -many here, many-to-many -many there. And I've said it before that many-to-many -many cannot exist. There's no such thing. It exists in the concept. It cannot exist in the real world in a physical database. So we resolve it. We're actually going to be talking about resolving them next week. But essentially what's happened is whenever there was a many-to-many -many relationship, in this diagram, you will notice that we added in a new ad entity. So you'll have an employee department entity. Where'd my laser go? Right here. An employee, employee department entity. We also have an employee project entity. For those of you on this side, so you don't feel left out. This entity here and this entity here were created. 
they were created to avoid many to many. Um, literally, when I'm going to be talking about physical diagramming in a week or two, I'll be talking about how to resolve those better. But these are known as associative entities. So they're an entity that associates two other entities. They exist to resolve many to many. That's their purpose in life. Okay, so after we've created our diagram, is everything clear? Check the cardinality pairs. Look, make sure there's no attributes that have been missing. If anything's missing, you do another round of repairs. Um, then when we want to convert a physical diagram, conceptual to physical, we want to convert all the entities into tables. So an entity becomes a table. You guys know what tables are. You learned them last semester. All single valid attributes of an entity become a column. Surprise, you guys know what those all are, columns or fields. Um, keys become primary keys. Um, if we have a multi-valued attribute, those will also become tables. Yeah. It's not a many. It's one to many, one to many. This is many to many. So many on both sides. When you resolve it, there's only many at one end. At one end. That's resolving the many to many. So the if you want a physical example of what happens, you got your many to many, right? Like this. When you resolve it, it looks like this. The many, many points in the the many points in the middle, not at the ends anymore. It's because you take out the many at each end. You make the many point at a new entity in the middle, and you have ones on the outside with many in the middle. So you cut the lines, flip them, and put something in the middle. Well, right now it's still showing that an employee, if you look at it right there, you'll see that it still shows mandatory. So the project must have an entry in employee project. And employee project must have at least one employee. So it's showing that this must have one of these, this entry must have one of those. And since it's mandatory on both sides, this must exist for the project to exist. It's still the same rules. It's just they've been um, expanded a little bit. But in the end, it's the exact same effect. Yeah, it's a bridging table. So it maps. So it maps. So before we had employee project was many to many. So and a project could have many employees. An employee could work on many projects. Okay? Or nothing at all. But who cares about that one? I'm caring about the many part. For the moment. Okay? So an employee can have many projects. A project can have many employees. Many to many. In a physical database, you cannot do that. It's physically impossible to create that relationship. Instead, we create something called an associative entity or a bridge table or an intersection table. There's many names for this. And what this is, it's a new table that sits in the middle that will take data from both those two tables to make the association. Oh, last week there was like markers. This week there's no markers. It's a good the reason I carry markers. Okay, so for example, we have employee. Okay, employee ID one, Dan. Employee two, Bob. Three, Jane. Okay, we have project. Project one. Three projects, okay? Originally, the diagram is set up like this, okay? Now, tell me how you're going to connect those. That's why we physically can't do it in the database. There's no way to write a query to do this. It's physically impossible. Because if Dan, so we have Dan's connected to this. 
B is connected to this and this, and Jane is connected to that one, and nothing's connected to two. There's no way to actually physically do this in a database. You can't. There's no way. There's I've only ever seen one database engine that could do it, and even they said, don't ever do this. How do you do it? You create, so what you do is you create a new one like this, and you take this relationship and you actually turn it into this. Okay? Now we get rid of this relationship. So we have Dan. So in here we have the employee ID. And we have the project ID. Dan belongs to project, so Dan's employee one, belongs to, has projects one and two. Bob works on project two and three. Jane works only on project two. Okay. Now, this is where that whole can the mandatory on both sides thing, where that was confusing you a little bit. Technically, there's no such thing. Yeah, I know that's what it looked. Yeah, and this is one of those things where technically you cannot, it, that's um, the, the, the relationship at this point is a concept. It's a concept that can actually be physically implemented. The strange thing about database design is sometimes you'll have concepts that are that exist at the conceptual stage, and then you get to the physical stage, and they cannot exist. So therefore, there's now at, at, at suddenly becomes something known as a business rule, where a project cannot exist without an employee. It has nothing to do with the physical manifestation of the data. It has to do with the rules of the business instead, and you have to learn to at, separate the two a little bit, and it's just a learning process, literally is. Without the between with the many to many, it's like this, literally like this would be a new table. And in this table, the way it works is And in the case of the department and the supervisor, you could choose to put the relationship in either place. Um, you could actually put a supervisor ID in the department, or you could put the department ID in supervisor. As long as you've got the foreign key in one place, it's fine. It does make a difference which way they go. For one-to-one, -one, it makes absolutely no difference where the foreign key is. It has to be in only one of the two tables. That's how you do one-to-one. -one. Okay? All right, did that kind of... Did this kind of explain that whole? Even if, it, like, like I'm saying, the, the mandatory, the second you end up with a many to many and one side is mandatory, that's a concept. It's something that can't be done physically. So when you start doing the physical diagram, this concept of mandatory must have an employee to exist goes away. Because it has to be able to exist, to be able to assign it to an employee. Chicken before the egg, right? How can you assign an employee to a project if the project does not exist, but the project cannot exist unless there's an employee assigned to it? So which one comes first? Yeah, the, the, that's where it suddenly changes, where that mandatory employee, the project is, as he just said, the project becomes functional once you've assigned an employee to it. It's a valid project. But that doesn't mean that it, the project can't exist. It's just not a valid project. It's a business concept, not a physical concept. Because realistically, you cannot assign an employee to a project unless the project exists. But they're saying the project cannot exist unless you gave it an employee. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's it's a it's a um, hang on. It's a um, it's like an Amazon order. You can't have an order without something in it. 
but you can't put something in it unless there's an order. Yeah, the same thing. It's the exact same thing where a, a course can be assigned. Well, the, yes and no, because then it's a one-to-many relationship, but it's because you wouldn't have this happening. You could have the course, you could have the professor, but you wouldn't have a bridge table because it's, it's a one-to-many. This is the only time this gets like weird like this. It's when it's many-to-many. -many. But it's the same idea. When you go to Loblaws and you check out, you can't have a receipt unless you have things to put on the receipt. But you can't put things on the receipt unless you have a receipt. It's like, you know. So you know the second you go to the store and you hit start or you scan your first item? You know what's happening right there. The first thing it does, it creates a new order in their system. And then it assigns the first thing to the order. But it creates the order first. But technically, the order cannot exist without at least one thing in it. The order at Amazon exists the second you put something in your shopping cart. But the products also exist. Yes. What do you think the cart what 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 do you think the cart is? We're simplifying. We're simplifying. We're trying to keep it simple so people understand the concepts. We're not trying to get lost in the weeds. Yes, technically, you walk into Law of Laws, grab your shopping cart, you're putting shit in the cart. Technically, you've started an order. The second you put something in that cart, you're on the hook for it. Technically, you've legally started an order. You've started a transaction with Law of Laws. The second you put something in your shopping cart or in your basket. Legally, you have started an order. Conceptually, you have put something in your basket, which the basket is synonymous to an order. It used to be when you used to check out at a store, they'd say, let's check out your basket. People don't say that anymore. But that's what the verbiage used to be. Actually, more so in French than in English. But it would be, we're going to check out the contents of your basket. And then they give you a receipt. Not once they talk about your, your order, they just talk about what you bought in your basket. Shopping cart is the same thing as an order, except it has you have not seen the magic number that they gave to you in the background. That is all. Amazon, I have a friend that works at Amazon in the Kindle division, not in the main shopping section. Even the second you go browsing on the site and you log in, there is an order with nothing in attached to you. That order number is set the minute you check out and you go back to an empty shopping cart, you already have your next order number. They've already assigned it to you. You just don't see it till you check out. Okay? But the car, but the thing is that they're they're just differentiating the difference between an order and a cart for you guys, so you guys understand what the difference is. Realistically, somewhere deep inside of Amazon's world, that cart has a number. You just don't see it. But the guy I'm talking about is a software developer for their shopping cart. He knows there's a number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He actually codes part of the shop, the Kindle shopping cart checkout process. Yeah, it's the exact same thing, except it's a D book. Hang on, she was saying something, and I'll get to you. It's there. It's just, you, don't, you don't see it until it's done. Yeah, well, it's actually assigned to you before you check out. Every shopping cart in Amazon has a unique number. They just add a prefix on it that suddenly turns it into an order. So there's like a magic little bit they'll put in front of it to, to track the order. There's, they do. It gets really complicated. I'm trying to keep it simple. You're talking architecture, which is a totally different story. It can get a lot more complicated than that. Uh, yeah, we're not going to talk about ephemeral tables. 
not going there. Okay, so when we're taking a conceptual diagram, we're converting it to a physical diagram, and we're almost finished, folks. There's like three slides left. You want to take all your entities, convert them to tables. We want to take all the single valued attributes, they become columns. Primary keys, multi valued attributes become tables. So remember last week when I talked about an example, an employee with skills? The skills would become a table. So an employee has a skill of, you know, PHP, comma, SQL, comma, Python, because we just have it in a field. But that's multi-valued. Those actually has to become another table. Because you can't put more than one value in a field. So you have more than one value, it's multi-valued, it has to be a new table. Uh, composite attributes become separate columns. For example, address becomes separate columns. Um, you would usually ignore derived attributes unless you need to keep them for performance reasons. Uh, and then you assign them data types. So our diagram here, which, you know, causes all kinds of confusion, becomes this as a physical diagram. Uh, this is done in my SQL workbench. Um, that's not the whole diagram. That's only a partial diagram. But it's just show you guys, you know, part of it. So you'll see a one-to-one -one relationship between um, department and supervisor. The supervisor has a number and a name. Uh, department has a department name and a supervisor number. I didn't create this diagram. You can see it doesn't follow naming conventions. It literally looks like somebody just threw up can naming conventions at it. Um, the employee to department map, this, for example, um, basically has a bridge table in the middle. And whoever created this diagram did it wrong. Can anybody spot what's wrong on this diagram? And I actually always left, I've left the mistake there on purpose every year. Yes, it's backwards. If you look at this slide, that last relationship at the bottom, right here, they did it backwards. It should be the other way. It should be looking like this, not like this. I left it there as a sanity check and to make a point that the prof that used to teach this course actually created the slide and they thought it was right. Um, not being mean or anything, they just weren't paying attention when they did it. Um, and that brings to the end of the slide. So I'm going to show you guys two things. Um, for conceptual diagramming, there's a fantastic website called ERD+. Um, ERDplus.com is free. So you guys can create your own accounts and save your documents there. Uh, it was created by a couple of university profs. Well, you know it wasn't created by the profs, right? It was created by their students. Anybody who's been to university knows how exactly how that works. The professors don't do any real work. They just get their, um, their uh, what they, they call them, their uh, research associates to do all the work for them, student projects. Um, and where did it go? Right there. Okay, so the reason why I really like this tool compared to, say, Visio or uh, Draw.io or whatever it's called now, Diagram.net or something. So what I like about this one is it's actually literally designed just for ERDs. It knows it. It knows exactly how things are supposed to behave. It uses the right terminology and the right symbols. So I'm going to throw on two entities. And we're going to go employee and department fantastic you will notice when i pick an entity that we have a, a couple of extra choices in here that realistically we haven't really talked about we have a regular ent entity also known as a strong entity we have weak entities remember last week i talked about weak entities entities that cannot exist without something else to define it such as a loan cannot i mean a payment cannot exist without a loan so that's a weak entity. Uh, this actually supports the symbols, all the symbols for them. Uh, I'm going to put in um, a kind of relationship between employee and department. 
it draws my diamond. So uh, I'm just going to say assigned. Cool. So this looks as similar to what we were doing earlier. What What's really nifty is here we can actually say, um, we can set our rules and it draws the symbols in CrossFit properly, which is, you know, kind of handy to do it correctly. Um, we can actually add attributes to our employees. So here's our uh, employee number. And in this case, they use the word unique as our identifier because that's what we figure the primary key is going to be. Um, I'm going to add another attribute, a person's name. All right. So this is stuff that, you know, so far you guys saw for the example we were doing. I'm going to just show you guys some of the other symbols that is not covered in the slides, just so that you know what they look like. So on the employee, we can add um, a derived attribute called age. And we can add another attribute called uh, date of birth, which is fine. Age is derived because we can calculate it now minus date of birth equals how old someone is. It's a piece of math. Yes. It's for the client. It's also for documentation purposes. You'll want to document what the relationships are. And this is part of the project planning phase. So you take this, get it signed off, and then you convert it to a physical diagram. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just that when you're talking to the clients, you can talk, you can decide what level of detail you need to include. You can choose to not include the, the relationships. Like you have the relationships, but not the cardinality. If you're really talking to somebody who, you know, you need to explain to the person that works in shipping what the relationship is between the order on the screen and the box they're going to ship, you're probably just going to have the entities and the relationships and leave it there. If you're going to talk to a project planner or somebody who's a little more familiar with how the processes are, then you'll include the cardinality and you can explain to them, that's what these symbols mean. You might have to explain it two, three times, but after a few goes at the, a few kicks at the can, they'll understand it fairly well also. Then you add the attributes for those that want to know. So these are all the different kinds of attributes you can include. Um, and the last major type of attribute um, is a composite attribute. The, most, the best example of a composite attribute is an address. And there's a few ways you can choose to put this on a diagram. You can do address, mark it as composite, and leave it at, at that. Because at that point, somebody who's looking at this diagram that knows this notation will understand it's a composite attribute. It's made up of multiple things. You may end up with a boss that's a little anal retentive, and they want to have all the details on there. Well, so what you can do is you can add a component attribute using this tool. And this would be street. City. Region. Postal code. And now we have our composite that shows up all the pieces, which is nifty. But one of the reasons why I really like this tool is I can grab this and it brings it all along together. Unlike a like a lot diagram tools like draw that IO where you grab one thing and you move it and everything just breaks, this actually knows what everything's connected to it. But the other nifty part is you can just grab this piece and move it too. It's just a really handy tool. So ERD plus is probably the best ERD diagramming. I use it. I use it at my um, current job. I haven't had to do any ERDs. I don't know what they use for ERDs yet. But my previous job, I used to use this all the time. It's a free project. I just it's a free product. I just used it because it did such a good job. Uh, and when you're done, you can go, uh, it, say, it auto saves, but you can also export um, and save. And there's my diagram. 
nice and exported. No screenshots required because it exports it to its real size. That means it's actually, you know, properly zoomable. All right. Um, last one I'm going to touch on is MySQL Workbench. I'm going to do a two second tour of that. There's way better tutorials on YouTube on how to use MySQL Workbench than I can do for you guys. Just, just saying. Um, but to start a diagram in MySQL Workbench, it's this icon here. You hit the plus. You add diagram. And this is what you need for lab three. You don't need this for lab two yet. So just putting things ahead. Uh, creating your table is this icon. Creating another table, this icon. And creating my relationship between them. Um, what's, uh, you need to have a primary key in the table first. So you double click on it. ID. Name, ID, description, and your your relationship tools are here. And earlier, when we we're talking about the many-to-many -many relationship, you saw in ERD Plus, I had the many-to-many -many relationship. I drew it. Here's what happens if, because this, I've had students in the past go, shoot. I've had students in the past go, hey, I tried to do a many-to-many -many relationship and MySQL Workbench did something weird. So this is the many-to-many -many tool. Click on one, click on the other, and it creates a third table for you. It creates it for you automatically, the associative entity, because you cannot physically create a many-to-many -many relationship in MySQL. There's no such thing. Therefore, they decided we'll make it easier on the people to do it by doing it automatically for them. Um, setting data types is literally, you edit the column, set the data types here. Um, if you want to set optionality for the relationships, uh, you double click on the relationship and on the foreign keys, you can choose to make things mandatory or not. And a lot of people will notice, this is why I'm not a big fan of this product. It's a little buggy. Um, you notice I'm doing mandatory, not mandatory, nothing is changing on the diagram. The second I click on the diagram, it changes. It doesn't change when you hit the checkbox, it changes when you click on the diagram, which causes people to go, well, I'm making this change and if nothing's happening. Trust me, it's happening. It's just not showing it to you. So I'm just highlighting some of the quirks and features of MySQL Workbench, more quirks than features. Um, but that's the two big ones. It's all going to be recorded, so it's all going to go YouTube anyways. So, um, the last item, how many of you have more than one display at home? Let's for shits and giggles. Launch my SQL workbench, put it on your secondary display and try to create a diagram. Let me know how that works for you. Because every single time it's crashed my SQL workbench for me, it hangs it. I don't know why. So if it just so happens that, you know, you've launched it before on the secondary display, it's going to launch there again, right? Usually. And then you go to create a diagram and it crashes. If it's doing that, put it on your primary display and it's going to work. I spent at least 15 minutes one day trying to figure out why this was happening. I don't know why. And it's been like this for five years. Version, so MySQL Workbench 5.7, because they skipped 6 and 7. They just went from 5 to 8, just like MySQL went from 5 to 8. 5.7 didn't have this problem. It's whatever they did when they released the version 8 of this product. Your guess is as good as mine. It's uh, trash. But it's the trash you have to use. So it is what it is. Um, okay, so this week you need to finish lab one by Friday. That means you need to upload those screenshots. I haven't checked how many other people have done it since I last checked on Thursday. 
But on Thursday, two-thirds of the group had it done. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, lab two is you're given blocks of texts and you're going to identify uh, the entities and the attributes. Um, let me double check that because maybe I'm remembering the wrong group of students. It's a problem when you teach three different database courses. Every once in a while you start getting confused what the different labs are. Yeah. So lab two is you're given uh, two scenarios and you are going to you're not even going to diagram it. You're just going to do. A, you're going to identify the entities and their attributes. And that's it. It's just an exercise in you identifying the entities and the attributes. There is an example here, like a super simple example that shows you what the notation should look like. I don't want paragraphs of text. You just make my life harder. Literally, give me its bullet point, entity, arrow, attributes, and if it's a primary key, bold it. Word document and upload. Um, yeah, just follow the, syntax, the sample I've given you guys on how to format it. It just makes my grading life a lot easier, which makes me happy, which makes me not cranky. Um, lab three is the diagramming lab. Yes, lab three is the diagramming lab. So technically, as of today, you have everything for lab two and three. So if you want to start getting ahead, before you get slammed in your other courses, this is a good time to reach ahead a little bit and maybe just suck it up for like an extra hour one day and just do both labs. Just, just, just a thought. Because I know just before the midterm in most programs, it gets pretty hairy. And the more you have done early, the less you have to worry about it later. Okay. Uh, that's it. We are officially caught up to where we needed to be for this week. So starting next week, the lectures are probably going to be about an hour, an hour, 15 minutes long, a little bit shorter going forward. So no problem. Have a good one.